I'm Jeff Forster. I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, normally it would be my turn to speak, but uh, we have a very special guest with us today, and uh, I'm just thrilled about uh, this opportunity. We have Dr. David Nelms. He's the founder of the Timothy Initiative, which is, in my mind, I've, I've been looking all over the world, and in my mind, this is the premier church planting, church starting, disciple making uh, organization in the entire world. And so it's our great privilege. Dr. Nelms, if you'd come on up, uh, I'd like to introduce you. Yeah, give him a hand. Yeah. <laughs> David Nelms is one of my heroes. He's, he's one of the guys that, so I, I, every once in a while I'll have some young people come and say, Jeff, who should I be paying attention to? And I'll tell you who I pay attention to. I've got three or four people in my whole life that I don't say no to. My wife is the first one I don't say no to. And then after that, I've got a couple of pastor friends, David Nelms being one of them. And uh, I, I think that uh, God has used him in an extraordinary, extraordinary way. He was a church planter for years. We got kicked out of the same Bible college. So that says a lot, right? Um, I just love anybody. Here's my feeling about that. If you can't get kicked out of Bible college at least once, you're not trying. That's the way I feel about it, right? So, uh, and then he went on, started some churches, and just grew some dynamic ministries. And then God began to lay on his heart a strategy for disciple making disciples. And um, began to plant churches. And so now upwards of 60,000 churches have been started through the Timothy Initiative, serving almost 20,000 widows and orphans and f over 42 different countries, I think, that they've been in. And uh, I've been where he and his teams work, and it's the real deal. There's a lot of fraudulent organizations out there or less than truthful organizations, and so far we haven't been able to find one untruthful thing in the entire organization. I would say this, in Nepal, he was driving through the mountains, and he claims he saw a monkey reading a newspaper. <laughs> and we can't shake him off of it. He demand no, none of us saw it, but uh, Kurt Wiggins swears he didn't see it. He looked, but David swears it. So here's what I want to say to you today. You can believe 99.999% of everything David Nelms tells you, because I'm not sure monkeys read newspapers, but that's what he claims. Uh, so we've been doing this campaign called uh, Change for Churches, and our goal was to try to raise enough money for 30 churches. We can plant a brand new church around the world for about $300, which is staggering. You guys drank more than $300 worth of coffee before you walked in here just a few minutes ago. That's why you're so hyped up on caffeine. Uh, but for 300 bucks, we can start a brand new church. And so we set that goal as one of our goals. And um, uh, our Emily City campus, they raised enough money for 10 churches, which is incredible. And then our children raised money for almost 10 churches. And then you raised enough money for like 82 churches. And so here's what I want to do. Can we bring a check out? Look at this. Here's some of the kids from Heritage Church. Right here, they helped us. Dr. Nelms. Hold it up high, guys. Hold it up high. $30,612.76. So yeah. Good job, guys. You guys are awesome. Thank you. Let me shake your hand, tell you we love you. Thank you, buddy. I asked Dr. Nelms to uh, give a message today that I heard him give at the Converge Worldwide organization um, this past summer. We're a part of an organization. We partnered together Thank with you. a group that plants churches here in the U.S., and he gave one of the best messages that I've heard in a while about our responsibility and our opportunity to make a difference in the world, and so I asked him to share that today. That's because you have all the time in the world. They said that they don't have to be gone until they're going to try to beat the Methodists down to the big boy about <laughs> one or two o'clock. <laughs> Hey, thank you, Jeff. Yeah, I love your pastor. Isn't he, isn't he funny? The, the difference in him and me is when I got kicked out of Bible college, they let me back in. They didn't let him back in. When they kicked him out, it, it, was, it was for good. I want to thank you for that check. That's going to plant uh, 102 churches. They really can be planted for $300. Let me begin by saying I'm thrilled to just to be in the same room with you guys. Uh, you're a people with a passion, a passion for getting what we call the Great Commission, the good news that Jesus is the way, the truth, the life to all the nations, to all the world. I want to thank you for your partnership. TTI, the Timothy Initiative, we make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And when you do it in the context of a little village where there's never been a church, what happens is those new believers will gather together and when they gather, you, by the way, you don't have to twist their arm. You don't even have to offer coffee or donuts. They just, they just want to gather together. 
I mean, if you're in a village of all Hindus or all Buddhists or all Muslims and there's just two believers, you, you want to gather together. And when they gather together, they worship and they study the scriptures and they pray and they fellowship. You know what that is? That's a church. The byproduct of making disciples who make disciples are churches begin to spring up. Now think rabbits. Don't think elephants. Think little churches that multiply very rapidly. And so that's what happens. We primarily work, again, in your Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist world, your animist Muslim world in Africa. We focus on unreached people groups. We're currently planting churches among over 700 unreached people groups around the world. Uh, there'll be 18,000 more churches, Lord willing, started this year. And I keep saying we. We does not mean me. I have actually been to this campus now, I think, well, if you count last night, four times, at least four times that I know of. And I've stayed at that Hyatt place twice now, I think. And it's like 1.4 miles from here. I still have to use my GPS to get here, okay? I, I can't, I, I, I don't know what my problem is. But when I say we, I don't mean me. I mean we. TTI can do nothing without partners. Uh, we do it together. Let me show you the first picture. If you want to put that first slide up for me. This is an example of a, of a church that we would plant. It's what I call a mountain church. It's actually up in the, you can see the mountains behind it there. You just climb and climb and climb and climb. Jeff's been there. Chad's been there. And you get to the top and, and there's a church. Can somebody say Amen. Isn't that beautiful? I'm so glad those people know Jesus now. That's a mountain church. Uh, look at the next picture. This next one is a, uh, this is what we'd call a, a stairwell church. Uh, we've got thousands of these. And you, see, you say, how do you do it for $300? We don't build buildings. We don't pay salaries. We train regular normal people like you. Uh, the Great Commission was not given to pastors. The Great Commission was given, there was not a pastor on the earth when Jesus gave the Great Commission. The Great Commission was given to normal people. And we all know pastors are not normal people. Amen? <laughs> they are not. So it's obvious it was not given to pastors. It was given to normal people. And so they just use their home and they reach their neighbors. Look at the next picture. This is a good one. I it's what we call a tree church. Uh, can you all figure out, can you Ohio people figure out why we call it a tree church? Okay. Um, the, uh, I don't know what it is about Africa. Some of you, how many of you have ever been to Africa? There's always one tree, okay? There's never two trees or three trees. There's always one tree, and I don't know why, but there is. And that's, that's where we start the churches typically, and so we would call that a tree church. Now, recently, I was in Myanmar just a few weeks ago with your pastor and Bill over here. Where's Pizza Bill? There he is. And with uh, Chad. And so look at the next picture. I took this picture. I thought you guys would like it. That's, uh, that's uh, Jeff and Chad eating their, their lunch, their banana. Chad looks like he's getting ready to throw his up. Of course, come to think of it, he looks that way most of the time, so maybe not. Look at the next slide. Here they are. Uh, we're going out to the, it's one of those places where the houses are built on the lake, on the stilts. We have lake churches, and the birds were there. I thought that was a neat picture. See, Jeff? Jeff kind of looks cocky in that picture, but... Look at it there. And then look at the next slide. I have no words for this. I have no idea. I have no idea what they were doing. But anyway, what I'm trying to say is this. We are, I'm just thrilled to be here this morning. You guys have become a major partner. And listen, over the next few years, we're going to plant a lot of churches. We're going to plant a lot of churches together where there have never been churches. Where people in Myanmar, we were in a lake church. Little girl stood up, teenage girl stood up, said before she got saved, said, I'd never heard of Jesus, had no idea who he was. And I know that's hard for us to understand because you drove by 10 churches on your way to church this morning, okay? But you've got to you hear me. There are immense parts of this world where they have no idea who Jesus is. They just don't know. And it's not that they're rejecting Jesus. It's that nobody's ever told them who he is. And it's about time that somebody, somebody told them. I want to begin with a verse, Revelation 5, verse 9. It tells us one day that, uh, and by the way, I live for this verse. This is like, uh, this is my dream. One day I'm going to close my eyes down here. I'm going to open my eyes up there. And at some point up there, I'm going to find myself on my face at his feet, worshiping him. 
And when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing his praise than when we first begun. And I'm going to praise him. I'm going to worship him. But at some point, I'm going to notice that I'm not there alone. There are people all around me, thousands and thousands and 10,000 times 10,000 and, 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 and just more than you can count. And then I'll begin to notice, as this verse says, that there will be people that are worshipers around the throne of Jesus Christ from every tribe, in every language, in every people group, in every nation. Not some of them, not most of them, but all of them. And one day I was reading this passage and I asked myself, how, how, will, it, how, how, will, how will this happen? The world is so big and it's so lost. It seems like the... the, 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 the it seems like it's getting bigger and, and loster. Is that a word? They, I got kicked out of college, remember? Uh, it's getting bigger and loster all the time. And so how, how will it happen? How will the task finally be finished? Let me walk, walk you through the progression. First, let's go back. First, it was his turn, Jesus Christ. It was his turn. He got it all started. First John 4 and verse 14 is an amazing verse. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Say this verse with me. The Father sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. And so Jesus came all the way to the cross. He did what his Father sent him to do. He dotted every I, crossed every T, fulfilled every prophecy, shed every drop of blood that needed to be shed to provide redemption for the world. As he entered this world, Hebrew says, he came crying out, Father, I delight to do your will Oh, my God, I delight, I delight. I'm not just willing, I delight. You want me to die on a cross? I'll die on a cross. You want my back, whip, whip my back, a crown of thorns on my head, press it down. I delight to do thy will, oh, God. And he did the Father's will. He was the Redeemer, the Savior, the mediator of a new covenant between God and man. He did his part. He did it perfectly. He was the perfect, sinless, spotless sacrifice. And only when he had done everything the Father sent him to do, then he shouted out in victory, it is finished. Amen? Amen. First it was his turn. And man, he knocked it out of the park. Then... It was their turn, their turn. I'm talking about that first church, the people that he discipled. John 20, 21, Jesus said to the disciples, he said, as my father has sent me, even so, I'm now sending you. I'm sending you to do the same thing the father sent me to do. I've come and pro provided redemption. Now it's your job to go tell the world that that redemption is provided for them. Now I know that first church had their ups and downs. Sometimes we romanticize, at least I do, the first church. And I know they weren't perfect. They had an Ananias. They had a Sapphira. They had a Demas. They, they, they had all kinds. Of, they had their own issues, okay? But let me tell you something. They got the job done. The Bible says they filled Jerusalem with their teaching. The Bible says they never ceased teaching and preaching that Jesus was the Christ. When persecution came, the Bible says those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. They didn't shake their fists in the face of God and say, why would you let this happen to me? But rather they raised their hands to heaven and said, oh God, thank you for the privilege of suffering shame for your name. Listen to this verse, Acts 17 and verse 6. They came to be known as the people who had turned the world upside down. Oh, Jeff, that's my prayer for Michigan. That's my prayer for your area here. Oh, God, give us a group of people that will turn their cities, turn their nation upside down for Jesus Christ. Listen, nothing stopped those people. You couldn't stop them. You could knock them down, but you could not knock them out. They could be pressed, but you could not pin them. You could uh, threaten them, but they refused to be silenced. Bite them with a poisonous snake, <clears throat> they'd walk over to the fire and shake the snake into the fire and go heal somebody. You could lock them behind iron gates and the church would just go to prayer. See, they believed in prayer. The church would just go to prayer and those iron gates would just open up and the apostles would walk out. You could pick up rocks and you could stone them. And you could even kill them, but they would just either rise up and walk into heaven to meet Jesus, or they'd rise up 
and walk into the next village or the town to plant Jesus. You can throw them in jail. They just have church behind the bars. And the next morning when the earthquake came and they're walking out, they'd stop off at the jailer's house and start a new church there in the jailer's house. The gates of hell could not stand against these people. I mean, they were kicking down the gates of, of hell. You say, David, they must have had a lot of resources. They must have had a lot of tools. How'd they get the job done? Well, let me tell you, first of all, what they did not have. They had no seminaries, no salaries, no degrees, no denominations, no co computers, no committees, no airplanes, no automobiles. They didn't have Siri, Alexa, Facebook, Twitter. They had no buildings. They had no boards. They had no bylaws. They had no business meetings. They had no Bible colleges. They had no Bibles. The Bible wasn't written yet. You're not going to believe this one. They didn't even have Chick-fil-A. Amen? <coughs> I don't know if y'all have that up here or not. I haven't seen one. I've been looking. Uh, they, they didn't have Chick-fil-A. You say, well, David, how in the world did they get the job done? Oh, listen to this. Oh, my goodness. They had a holy helper. Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses here, near, and to the ends of the earth. Filled with the Spirit, they went out proclaiming Jesus, making disciple makers everywhere. And may I remind you that in their day, the entire world was what we would call an unengaged, unreached people group. There were no denominations. There was no uh, publishing houses. There was no nothing. The entire world was unreached and unengaged and yet fearlessly in the power of the Holy Spirit, they went out and they turned that world upside down. They paid an awful price. This world was not worthy of those people. First it was his turn. Praise his holy name. Then it was their turn. Guess what? Guess whose turn it is now? Somebody tell me, whose turn is it? Yeah, it's our turn. It's our turn to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Now, the task before us is enormous. It's enormous. Let me show you some slides. Uh, 40 uh, plus percent of the world, 40 to 43 percent of the world today is considered unreached. That's almost 3 billion people. That's a lot of people, ladies and gentlemen. Three billion people are in that unengaged or unreached, unengaged classification. In other words, they just don't know who he is. Nobody's ever told them. Look at the next slide. There's some 7,000 people groups out there. There are 17,000 different ethnicities in the world. When Jesus said, go make disciples of all nations, he used the word ethne. We get our word ethnicity. He was not referring to a geopolitical nation like Canada, USA, Mexico. He was referring to people groups, distinct uh, people groups that have their own language, diet, culture, tradition, dress, people groups. There are 17,000 people groups in the world today. 7,000 of them are still considered unreached. And look at the next slide. 1,000 of those are unengaged. And Jeff, I'm just excited about this. We are currently planting churches among over 700 of those 7,000 uh, and 39 of the 1,000, we are, that's about 10% of the unreached people groups. And again, when I say we, I don't mean me. I mean us. You guys are a part of this. You're a part of doing what Jesus told us to do. Look at the next slide. This is my all-time favorite slide, my Coca-Cola slide. And by the way, if you got a Coke Zero here, I'll take one, okay? But uh, I'm a, I was raised in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, can you all tell I'm not from Michigan? <laughs> Is, is it that obvious? Okay. Well, at least I'm not from Ohio, okay? But uh, it could be worse, right? All right. I'm playing to the crowd, Jeff. Okay. Yeah, I, was I wasn't born in Atlanta. I was born just down the road from it, but raised there. And Atlanta is the birthplace of uh, Coca-Cola. We love coca -Cola. To me, Pepsi is a four-letter word, okay? I love Coca-Cola. But Coke kind of irritates me because they have accomplished in less than 150 years for the love of money what the Church of Jesus Christ has yet to accomplish in 2,000 years for the love of God and the love of people. Jesus said the greatest of all the commandments is to love God and love people. Sometimes I wonder if we love either. 
I can't imagine that if we love God, we wouldn't want the world to know about God. And I can't imagine that if we really love people, we wouldn't want people to know who God is so they can be in a relationship with him. Coke has accomplished for the love of money what we have not yet accomplished for the love of God. And that, that what bothers me the most about that is that it doesn't bother me more than it bothers me. That ought to break our hearts. I have been so many places in the world where, where they don't know who Jesus is. I, mean, I, could, I could stand here and tell you stories until the 5 o'clock service tonight. I could, I could talk to you all day about places I've been where they don't know about Jesus. They've never heard his name. Yet I can honestly say, and this isn't one of those monkey reading newspaper stories, I can honestly say I have never been any place where they, weren't, they didn't have Coca-Cola. I mean, I've, I've, believe it or not, I've climbed some mountains. I've, the junk, you go to where there, there's no road, and then you just walk, and you 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 get there, and there's no plumbing, there's no electricity, but there'll be two old guys sitting under a tree drinking a Coca-Cola. It'll be a hot Coca-Cola, but they'll be drinking Coca-Cola. And I'm just amazed. I'm thinking, how in the world have they got their product there? I don't know how they do it. Somehow they do it. But I'm convinced of this. If Coke can do it, the church can do it. Amen? Amen. If, church, if Coke can, the church can. If Coke can, the church Yeah, say it with me. If Coke can, the church can. Yeah, we ought to be able to do it, ladies and gentlemen. Look at this next picture. It just breaks my heart. The, the red you see here is that unreached part of the world, 3 billion people. And that doesn't, and the yellows is, is nominal at best. And it, that green, don't, don't get too cocky. The green part looks like we got the job done. Michigan's in the green part. And you've got a long ways to go here. And so, listen, ladies and gentlemen, we've got a, a, an enormous task before us. It's enormous. And yet the task is also, It's doable. It's doable. A major key to getting the job done is partnerships. Nobody can do it alone. But if we work together, we're better together, we can get the job done. There's an old African proverb that says, if you want to run, if you want to run fast, go alone. If you want to run far, go together. We, heritage, we can get the job done. You say, David, you really believe we can get the gospel to the entire world, every people group? I have no doubt about it. I know it's going to happen because the Bible says it's going to happen. It's just, I think God's just looking for a few people that will say, hey, I believe your word, and I, I'm, willing, I'm willing to do what you want me to do, and I believe I'm in that kind of a church today. I believe that's where I'm at today. You say, David, what's the next step? What's our plan? Well, number one, we must, basically, we got to do what the first church did. There must be a devotion to prayer. Paul, remember Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And so they imitated Paul. Well, now we need to get in line and imitate them. We need to follow the people who followed Paul, who followed Jesus. And what was the plan in that first church? It was, they were devoted to prayer, Acts 1 and verse 14. It, says, it doesn't say they pray, it says they were devoted to prayer. We must have a ramped up, serious, crying out for God's kingdom to advance prayer we need to pray that God would break our hearts over, our, over the world and break our hearts over, over our country. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not a political statement, but our country's in trouble. Uh, the, one, the, the, the only advantage I can think of of being 65, being an old guy, is I've been around a while. Our country's in trouble. I thought our tr- country was in trouble 40 years ago. But it, it's, it's not get. Listen, we, we need a revival. We must pray. I, don't, I, I told the group here last night, I do not believe the Holy Spirit is intimidated by your city, by your area, by, by Michigan. I believe God is looking for a handful of people who humble themselves and get on their knees and pray and seek God's face and turn from their wicked ways. I believe that's what we need to do. We must ramp up the prayer. And by the way, they've given, Jeff's given me permission. I'm looking for people that will join my prayer team. I, I need people to pray. If you'll see me, I'll sign you up. We need people to pray. Number two, there must be spirit-filled evangelism, Acts 4, 32, uh, 4, 31. This is the key to me. The Bible says, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. The Bible says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing in the context of bearing much fruit. He said, you want to see a lot of fruit? You can see a lot of fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. Paul said, I planted Apollos water. God gave the increase. The old hymn writer wrote these words, Spirit, 
of the living God fall fresh on me. Oh, that needs to be our prayer. Every morning when we awaken, I pray that prayer every day. Holy Spirit, fill me. God, let me show me someone today, lead me to someone today that I can speak to about you. That ought to be our prayer every single day. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh, fall fresh on me. I can tell you this much in Acts 2, when the Spirit fell for the first time, the Spirit came in, in the form of a mighty rushing wind and a, and a ball of, of fire. He entered the room, that upper room in fire and in wind. And ladies and gentlemen, my prayer is this. I want the Spirit's wind blowing in my face. I want the Spirit's fire hanging over my head. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh, fall fresh on me. Devoted prayer, Spirit-filled evangelism. And finally, how do we get the job done? There must be an obedience to the Great Commission. And obedience to the Great Commission. If you're, new, if you're new here, the Great Commission is this great uh, uh, command, if you will, that Jesus gave where he said, take the good news of, of how people can know God through the shed blood of, of, of myself, through Jesus Christ. Take that good news to the entire world. The Great Commission, though, is more. It is more than an option to be considered. It is more than a responsibility to be shouldered. And it is even more than just a command to be obeyed. Look at this verse, 2 Corinthians 5, 19. It is a deep honor, a deep honor that has been entrusted, committed to us by him. I've uh, been married 41 years. My wife's a Hoosier. <laughs> Nobody's perfect. And uh, back in the day, you had to get dad's permission to, to get married or to marry the daughter. I don't know how they do it today. Uh, but I remember I was real nervous because her dad was pretty tough. And uh, I remember sitting down with them in a private setting. I said, Mr. Lewis, I'd like to marry your daughter if you'll let me. You know, he gave me that cold stare. But in essence, what, here, here's, these aren't the words he said, but this is in essence what he said. He said, David, I love my daughter. She's my oldest child. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you to take good care of her. And she, he literally walked her down the aisle and handed her over to me. It was a trust. Do you understand what this verse is saying? Nail scar Jesus. Nail scar Jesus is looking at Heritage Church and he's saying, I'm trusting you to take the good news to the world. It's a trust. It's more than a responsibility, more than a command. It's even more than an honor. It's a trust. Can somebody say amen? amen? Yeah. It's our turn, church. It's our turn. First it was his turn, and then it was their turn. Now it's our turn. We need some people like uh, Omar. Can I show you some pictures in closing? Omar. Omar is uh, quite a guy. Yeah, go ahead and put it up for me. Omar is... Uh, uh, I found him in a refugee camp in northern Kenya. A bunch of Sudanese refugees had fled there. They had these huge refugee camps across northern Kenya and Uganda. Some of them have 100, 200,000 people living there. Many of the people that got there came by hiding under the dead bodies of their relatives as these different militias are just killing each other. And they get there and they're hopeless. And Omar is part of TTI and he started a church and led a bunch of people to the Lord. Then he opened a little training center and started training the church members to plant churches. And, and when I was there a couple of years ago, they had planted, I think it was 13, 14, 15 churches. And Omar said to me, he said, Dr. David, I want to take TTI back to Sudan, back where I came from. Is that okay? I said, I said Omar, Sudan is under Sharia. You, uh, are you sure you want to go there? Big smile. He said, yes, I want to go. I said, he lives up in the Nuba Mountain region of Sudan. And I said, well... You understand they will not be excited about you 
planting churches and, and training people to plant other churches. You understand that, don't you? Big smile. He said, yes, I understand. I said, Omar, they may kill you. Do you understand what you're asking to do? They may kill you. Big smile. Yes, I understand. I said, okay. A few months later, we were in Tanzania. Jeff was with me and Chad and uh, Bill and uh, or Bill wasn't on that trip, but Jeff and Chad were on the trip. And I was at a dinner, and Omar was there. We were at the same table, and I asked Omar, I said, how many, I said, have you gotten started yet? He said, yes. I said, how many training centers do you have? He said, nine. I said, how many Timothys, church planters, are you training? He said, 182. And it just blew me away. Where do you find 182 church planters in Sudan? I, I, it's just, uh, and somebody walked by, and I grabbed him. I said, you're not going to believe this. Omar has nine training centers and 180 Timothys in Sudan. And Omar interrupted me and said, no, 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 not 180, 182. <laughs> the guy's insane. He's doing his part. He understands it's my turn. Look at the next slide. This guy just amazes me. His name is David, David Burrell. He was in the Indian Army. He, he, uh, uh, he was a uh, devout Hindu. His wife was sick, about to die. Spent all the money he had on Hindu priests and witch doctors. And nobody helped him. And finally a Christian came along and just laid their hands on, on her and prayed for her. And God healed her. You say, does God still do that? You, believe it or not, he does. God just healed her. You say, that's impossible. Well, nothing's impossible with God. Amen. And so that's what the Bible says. It's about time we believed it. And so he, they laid her. And, and, and gosh, God healed her. Well, that got Dave's attention. He became a Christ follower. Then he became a church planter. He began planting churches and preaching about Jesus. And people got upset with him. And they beat him. And they beat him up real bad. And one night while he and his wife and his children were asleep in bed, they burnt his house down. By the grace of God, they escaped. Uh, his son, Daniel, who now works with us, about 30 years old, Daniel said to me, I was talking to Daniel one day, and, and I said, Daniel, why are you so quiet? Because he, he, he jabbers around me, but he doesn't talk out in public. And he, he told me this story. He said, when I was five years old, my daddy was in prison, the guy on the screen there, David. And he said, I, my mother was afraid he would starve, so she made him a little lunch and went to the jail to give him the, the lunch. And she had me by one hand and my my daughter, my sister, three years old, by the other hand. And as we walked to the jail, a mob began forming. They were yelling at us. And we got inside the, the building, and my mother tried to leave the food for Dad. And the jailer cursed and said, no, I'm, I'll not give him the food. I hope he starves and get out of here. And so he said, we turned and we walked out of the jail. And when we got outside, there was a big mob there. And we started walking through, and the people parted. But I was five years old. She had me here, my little sister here. And they were screaming and waving their fist at us and angry and just yelling at us. And I said, Daniel, what were they saying? And he said they were saying these words, burn them alive, kill them. They're not worthy to live. He said, from that day on, when I'm in a crowd, I kind of back up. I just can't talk much. That man has gone on to plant with his son over 4,000 churches. A few months ago, he's walking down the street and a motorcycle hit him, knocked him over, broke a bunch of ribs. They put him in the hospital. The motorcycle kept going, but he's back at it now. You can't stop this guy. This guy means business. This guy loves Jesus Christ. This guy's going to get it done till the day he dies. Somebody say Amen. We need people like David Burrow. Look at the next picture. I love this one here. This gal is illiterate, can't read. She entered one of our training centers. She can't read the book. And in the first four months, she led 80 people to Jesus Christ. Just imagine what she could do if she was as smart as we are. Amen? 80 people. You say, David, I can't, I can't be used of God. I can't even read. She can't either, but she's not letting. You see, you don't have to read if you pray and if you're filled with the Spirit and you just obey the commands of Jesus. You just do what he told you to do. That's all it takes, ladies and gentlemen. Look at the next picture. These guys are, these guys are blind. They're blind. They have these little faith comes by hearing proclaimers. They're a partner with us like you guys are. and They, they walk around with their sticks and and and. 
and when they, when, they come to, when they hear a crowd around them, they stop and they push the button and the people can hear the Bible in their own language and people gather around and they lead people to the Lord and they start churches that way. Nobody knows their name, but I guarantee you they know their names in heaven. I guarantee you the angels know who these guys are. They get it. It's our turn. My time's gone. Can I show you one more? The, uh, this is Muhammad. Next slide, Muhammad. Muhammad was in a West African prison. He was a terrorist. He killed Christians. He, killed, he burnt down churches. He did all kinds of bad stuff. And just a devout Muslim, and we started a church there in the prison, which, by the way, is a great place to start them. And he started noticing these prisoners coming to Christ and how their lives changed dramatically. Long story short, he came and began to listen and heard the word of God, and he gave his heart to Christ. They later, later let him out of prison and he went home and his entire family, they all disowned him. They beat him. They took away all he had. They burnt it all. They, 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 they cursed him. They despised him. But his attitude is, listen, I don't care what they throw at me. I don't care what happens. Jesus has forgiven my sins. He is the Son of God. It's true. It's a real story. It really happened. God sent his son to this earth, and his son died for me. And he didn't just die. He rose again. And now he loves me, and he has forgiven me, and he has changed my life, and he has given to me the honor to tell my world that he's willing to do the same for them. He understands it's our turn. First, it was his turn. Then it was their turn. Now it's, yeah. And by the way, it's really my turn and your turn. And all God's people said, I went four minutes over. I'll take that off the next service. Okay? Would you bow your heads for prayer, please? Father, Thank you for this great church. Thank you for the privilege to partner. Now, Lord, we got a big job ahead of us. It's a big job. But, Lord, I don't believe it scares you. I believe you're looking for some people who will pray, be filled with the Spirit, and obey your commands, who will say, it's my turn. Lord, raise those people up today. Lord, there are more dollars to be given. Lord, we could plant a lot more than 100 churches out of this room. Lord, this, this crowd could plant 100 churches for breakfast. I mean, it, it could, uh, Lord, there's a lot more that can be done. Lord, raise the dollars. Raise up the people that will be willing to be trained to be disciple makers right here. Right here. Lord, the truth is we don't really have to go to the ends of the earth because the ends of the earth, have, they've come right here to Detroit. So, Lord, would you do something great and mighty? Would you do, would you do greater than, than we could even think or imagine, Lord, that you would ever be able to do? That is my prayer for this church. In Jesus' name.